Hello, it was so lovely to see you at our webinar, Moving Forward Assessment and the Revised EYFS. And for those of you who couldn't make it, here is a recording where we have just asked Michael Freeston to talk about Birth to Five Matters. No, this is the key thing. Um, with the publication we produced was Getting It Right in the Early Years Foundation Stage, a review of the evidence, an excellent piece of research. We looked at all the international evidence that has become from early years provision since the Tickell review um, back in 2012. The finding of that was that fundamentally, um, the soundings of prime areas of learning, the characteristics of effective learning was still backed up by international evidence. There was no reason to move away from that. Um, so we submitted that to the DFE with little confidence that it might influence um, what was going on and true to form, um, it had very little impact. But I, for all of your audience, please, you can still get this document on early education. It is a brilliant piece of research. If you're doing either your level three study or anything higher up as well, it gives a, if, if nothing else, read the bibliography because it's got your entire research list to take on. It's an excellent piece of work. However, what came from that was the momentum to say, right, is that all we do? Um, and there was a real sense of feeling that actually using the sector itself to create resources that will help the sector is something we should pursue. And so we we formed a steering group um, and got Nancy Stewart as the lead uh, practitioner um, to invite practitioners to be involved in developing a um, additional uh, support materials for the development matters, uh, sorry, for the new EYFS that was being produced. I was astonished. A hundred people, academics and practitioners, were involved across 20 working groups, give, all donating their time for nothing, mm -hmm. working together towards a common purpose as a, as, a, as a demonstration of the commitment and enthusiasm that individuals have to make things better for the sector. I'm, I'm proud to have been part of it. I have to say, I'm, I was no direct involvement in any of it, but but to just be see these people working in their own time to actually produce this document, it, it's you know it really warms the cockles. Um, so it is out there now as additional guidance. Anybody can produce their guidance, um, and we commend it to the sector. Really, it is supported by a website of resources, and if it helps people think about their own curriculum plans, how they approach um, assessment how they observe children and issues around inclusion. Um, I would recommend it and people can uh, comment on it, uh, use it as they see fit and take it forward. Um, I'd be welcome if anybody has in, in the, uh, any of our participants have had an opportunity to read it now um, and just any views they've got because it is a, a learning process for us. It, it will be reviewed in time. Uh, we have capacity to do that and it is um, it is for the sector by the sector, and that means the feedback should come from the sector and will inform any future revisions as well. So Great. Good. No, so that's so good. Um, I look, we, we've looked at it and yeah. we really like it, and we're going to be um, mapping onto it as part of um, our pathway, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, and do you, so I suppose it's really resources like that are so important, aren't they? in giving practitioners confidence in those judgments that they're making. I'll, I'll just say one thing before inviting others. I think your introduction was exactly right. We, we applaud the emphasis that's being given in the new EYFS and the common inspection framework to the sector's expert professional judgment when it comes to assessing where children are in their progress. That assumes, and it sets the challenge for the sector, that we are experts and professional. Yeah. Um, now, we'd all like to think, but clearly we can't, all, well, we can all be experts, I suppose, but um, th that requires a huge amount of CPD and on training so that, and managerial oversight to ensure that that is taking place um, with all of our staff, because Ofsted are very good at identifying your weakest member of staff. Okay. And they will have those professional discussions about what is your provisions curriculum, how what's its intention, information and impact, as the CIF says, and you, your inspection will be as good as your weakest person, whether that's your intern, your apprentice or anybody. I can see Alex is nodding here because this is an innate skill that Ofsted inspectors have <laughs> is just knowing who to go and talk to. I think being an inspector as well, Michael, one of the I mean, 
you, you get a full insight on, on how some inspectors are not using the, the framework as best as they could, but that's another conversation for another time. For me, in lack of an absence of an assessment framework by the DFE, uh, what we're really risking is, and, and it is absolutely important for our practitioners to be expert, is when there is a disagreement with the parent or with an offset inspector about the development of the child, and there isn't an objective framework to refer to, what do you do? Mm -hmm. um, I think that is why a lot of the practitioners and the teachers like the birth to five framework because it provides them with that reassurance. It has been put together by the sector for the sector. Mm -hmm. It builds on the previous EYFS rather than completely disregarding what we've known for many years to be good practice and reinventing the wheel and going back, um, you know, where we were many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for me, it is really, really important to have a, a, a document like the birth to five framework where practitioners can refer and they can find ages and stages for development because yes. children do develop in, in ages yeah. and stages. Yes. Uh, I think and it is important for us to know those ages and stages. Yes, yes. I think it's a huge ask to expect practitioners to be experts in all areas of, mm. of development. You know, I'm a speech and language therapist and I will go in and I know a little bit about language and communication, mm. but I couldn't give you those details on other areas. So it's a huge, it's really important that practitioners are equipped. Mm. Um, I mean, Sorry. Yeah, go on. No, go on. The things that needs to change, there needs to be more training in child development from students coming in, particularly brain development. The brain development of Absolutely. the child is very, Absolutely. very seldom touched on in level. Well, it's touched on, but it's not. We, I mean, I found I, I trained a few years ago as a, a, a child play therapist, and I learned more in that training about the child's brain development than I ever learned in any training before. And it has been really, really so important. So yeah. important what we do. Totally agree with you, Claire. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. So Michael, going back to you, just, and this was something that we discussed when we met before, was with the focus moving away from the um, early learning goals. So in the, at the preschool stage, and, and one of the things that you said that, I wondered, you know, do you think there is going to be any downward pressure? And this may be something, Claire, that you also might experience is that from feeder schools, you know, we're, we're saying let's not think about the early learning goals at a preschool level. But do you how practical do you think that's going to be for nurseries? First of all, I'm, I'm a big defense. I, I feel for the DFE here. They yeah. will say, and absolutely from to, the focus should never have been on the early learning goals. Yeah. Um, that statement of the early learning goals are not the curriculum. They are merely a point of time assessment to take. Them. They have been consistent in that messaging. We yeah. have somehow, whether it's fear of Ofsted or something else, we have created this collective view across the sector. And I'd be interested in others' views about where this has come from, mm -hmm. that actually the development matters somehow shaped our curriculum. And, and if anything, at least the 20, uh, there's a restatement in the EYFS and the development matters document, that is not the case. And, and part of our training to our practitioners is nothing has changed. Good early years education remains good early years provision. If you're doing it, don't throw everything out. If you're doing things that work for you now, please, not in the light of these documents. So, um, I have issues with the early learning goals. I think the point you've made in terms of them becoming a checklist, if the gov DfE's stated ambition was to try and address the issue of them being used as a checklist, but my view on that is you don't then break them down into 54 different bullet points, which just allow somebody to go past and tick them. I think they might have had the right ambition, but I disagree with the way they went about trying to, to meet that aim. Um, so I, there are issues about the early involvement, but it's our challenge. And if we are saying we're producing too much paperwork, Ofsted quite rightly will say, well, that's your fault. We're, yeah. and they, they may historically have said we need lots of data, but they have genuinely said, not even since the EIF, but with the CIF back in 2017, Alex, am I right? 
it said then we are moving towards professional discussion we will observe your practice and we will have discussions with you we don't want data we don't want reams of photographs about what little johnny can do and can't do and things like that that's not their focus they want you to be able to articulate why you do what you do with the children who you do it for. And that's the challenge to us. Um, the, the second point, I think, having said all of that about the early learning goals, I think it's naive to ever say that if you create the end product, the, somehow that Im does not impact on the process all the way down. And that's clearly one of the challenges that's faced by reception teachers, particularly in schools where let's face it, head teachers and chair of governors probably don't have an early years background. Um, and, and, and so there are certain ongoing challenges for the staff in the, in the reception year to actually maintain the framework of the UIFS into, um, into their provision. Um, and I'll, if you don't mind, I'll make a comment on that in a second. Um, and there, I can see that inevitably, if that if that situation pervades, that will impact on the provider, P on the feeder PVI settings who feed into those schools. And um, it needs to be resisted, but I think there is a certain inevitability. Phil Mins, who, and just on my other comment, Phil Mins, uh, who's the early years advisor um, for Ofsted HMI, he has a great phrase that Ofsted probably made the mistake that in the past they have looked at a school at the end of key stage two, and if things, if the outcomes look all right, then there is an assumption that everything is going right down through the school. He says he'd love to turn that round, that if you look at the reception year and that is correct, then you can be confident that everything flowing up the other way yeah, will that. sort itself out. And yeah. I think that's a commendable, commendable vision and a really great strategy. And I, I hope he persuades head teachers that that's the case. Great, that's really so good. good. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, Alex or Claire or Natalie, do you have any other comments about the sort of uh, ELGs and the sort of- Well, we find it uh, on the ELGs, I mean, we find it very, when we are sending our children on to, to, to reception classes, the first thing we have to uns uh, unscramble is the parents' perception that when they go into school, and I know this sounds really un, uh, 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 naive of parents, and they're not all naive, but that they're going into school, that is end of early years, and to, to make them understand that reception is also early yeah. years. For yeah. a year. yeah. It is yeah. really hard, when, particularly in, in quite competitive uh, London schools, for them to understand that. Not helped by some schools who really do have reception classes as you were saying, Michael, that look like year one classes. So you're not seeing the differentiation between the, the play elements, which is so necessary yeah. uh, for reaching the early learning goals. Um, and I think this year has proved something to me, uh, noticing that the children who were in lockdown, who were, due, who were starting the reception year, missed out on virtually all their reception year yeah. and went straight into, stage, uh, into key stage one. And I think that's been a quite a lot of difficulty with that as well. I don't know how Natalie feels about that. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 yeah, and I think, um, I have noticed actually in the early years framework, the new one, there is a lot of, of about three pages at the back, which is all about early learning goals. And there's quite a lot of skipping over transition. There's a lot about transition Yes. from, from to year, to year, to year one. one, but there's not much about Transition from nursery to reception. Or nursery, nursery. Or nursery to nursery no. classes in nurseries, which is is something I think has been very missed. Yeah, yeah, it's a gap, isn't it? No, yeah. definitely, definitely. Um, I think we'll we'll move on because we've got so many questions to ask you all, um, and we sort of might come back to that. Um, Alex, so in the light of this change of perspective in the EYFS and with your experience with supporting and managing your nursery settings. What do you feel that practitioners need in relation to assessment to enable them to really understand a child's development and learning, as well as be able to sort of see and understand their progress? Um, I think good knowledge of child development is absolutely essential. You need to know um, good child development. You need to have realistic expectations of your children and what they can do 
um, under the different areas of learning according to their age group. Um, you need a well thought, defined curriculum um, that you have really thought about it and you designed it with your team and that curriculum needs to be um, responsive to the needs of your children. But you also need an assessment framework. Um, you need an assessment framework that provides you with a map of learning outcomes, uh, which you then can link to your educational program of, of studies and your curriculum, and which will provide key considerations on how you can use the information about the progress of your children to yeah. actually improve your teaching. Because I think the purpose of the tracking and, and where we achieved a lot with the previous EYFS was in actually using the tracking information to influence what we do with the children. And I think that is something that there has been a lot of negative publicity about the previous EYFS and, and the tracking and how practitioners were using tracking models that they couldn't interpret. But actually there were some that they were doing it right. So why are we throwing out the baby with the bathwater? Yes, yes. No, that's true. Yeah. That's so true. And, and Alex, um, you know, this, this sort of consistency of assessment across all your settings, um, you know, you're, you've managed that in the past. How, how, how can people sort of guarantee that, um, you know, if they've got more than one setting to have that kind of consistency regarding assessment? I think, first of all, it is a conversation to have with, with your teams. And um, you are given the flexibility, as Michael was saying earlier on, uh, something that's great about the revised DYFS and the revised uh, uh, inspection, inspection framework is that we're given the flexibility to design our own curriculum yeah. um, mm. and you know, make our, our practice really specific to our children and our families. So let's actually sit down and look at our curriculum and look at the assessment framework that we're using, personal, personalize it to our settings, and then develop some, some processes in to actually um, make sure that it is effective and it is consistent. So if I put my um, moderator's hat on from when I used to head moderation um, for a local authority, Yes, I understand that some local authorities were not using the moderation framework um, accurately, but actually there were some really, really important messages coming out uh, from moderation. Practitioners were saying how much they were valuing that discussion to celebrate the progress of the child and, and actually looking at the evidence and, and seeing, does the evidence correspond to where I have judged this child? Yeah. Without, you know, without any criticism, it was really a celebration of, of the child's learning. Um, so we would be looking um, at moderation as a group and how we can strengthen the, the assessments. Yeah, Great. that's so that's good. That's really good. Um, just just to pick up on that, Alex, it's, um, you, you recall that uh, almost after the fact, when everything was produced, there was a consultation on the revised EYFS. And I think 83% of the respondents said they wanted to keep the moderation because A, they found it valuable to make sure they were doing it correct, but also it was one of the few cross-site development opportunities they had but no it went anywhere the problem with the consultation michael is that the responses were not taken into consideration <laughs> so they consulted with the sector <laughs> but, but actually they didn't listen to anything that we've said yeah. you wouldn't so do that in an early years setting would you no, <laughs> you consult no. with the children and then you just ignore what it is that they were said they were going to do there's a thought. Tracking is not just important for us as teachers and the children in the school. It's really important for the parents. So the parents know where their children are. The parents know where how their children are developing. And um, we use ARC and we love ARC Pathways. We are one of it as are our parents because we can share that information not only with other teachers, not with the setting, but also the parents. And it's so easy to see where children are, where the gaps are, because with or without observations, these gaps are still going to be there. Mm -hmm. And it's really important we keep track of those children and how they are developing. Oh, that's, that's really, really good. good. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mentioning art. So just on that, Natalie and Claire, really, oh. sort of what what resources and you mentioned ARC and that's fantastic but what resources do you feel your staff need to give them confidence in um, making those judgments and being able to be confident in in talking with parents as well mm -hmm. and confidence in, in their work 
what sort of things do you feel is really important at this time? I, I definitely have said it's more training and child development. I think that's where mm, a lot of our staff feel kind of uneasy sort of about the new curriculum. And I think that's going to be really key in various boroughs, making sure that their training is tailored towards that. Um, mm. Communication, keeping open communication with our staff with, you know, Yes, I mean, definitely open communication, making sure they're involved with everything within the nursery um, and also very much open communication with the parents at all moments. And it is hard for them. And I think there is a tendency still. So everybody wants us to be professionals and, you know, we are being celebrated more as professionals to put us just into childcare category. Mm. We've, we've been for too long. The early years has been the poor relation in education. Um, I always say that for many years, I'd sit next to somebody at dinner, what do you do? Oh, you're a teacher, what do you teach early years? They turn their back on me because obviously I wasn't bright enough to be taught. But it, it, it's very, very tough. We need to have more professionalism within and, and celebrate that with, within the workforce. And I think often not, I, we sometimes get student teachers who we really feel we don't feel should be in the early years profession and somehow they've been put in there because somebody's once said some career advisor might have said to the school oh well you know you can go to child care you like children and 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 I think that still has to be unraveled um, yeah yeah, I, agree more. yeah I, I know I I wrote a, a book about resilience you know in the early years staff and um, in the sector and it, you know, it's so obvious that so many, uh, there's a sort of collection of teachers that come in or not people that come in into the sector who, like you say, Claire, have been told, you know, you're good with children or, well, you haven't got very good exam results, but why yeah. don't you think about childcare? Child and I think it's so maddening. And there's a, I would say there's a good sort of, I don't know, quarter to a third of the sector are those. And that's really sad because as you right. say, we. It's such an incredibly difficult job. I've never seen, I mean, I have, you have to multitask so much, don't you, um, during the day. And it's an, I, I know about brain development and everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, being professional. I, I, being I, I, yeah. If, I, if I can just share something, and um, Jackie reminded me how long I've been at the Alliance now at the start of this session. Uh, one of my earliest experiences, I was at a conference and um, I was, I was with a colleague and somebody had been speaking and said they, they had moved down from primary into early years. And, and so I asked, well, what do, what do you find is the biggest difference um, in the two? And I was expecting you to say terms and conditions or pay or something or other. Mm -hmm. She said it was the attitude of the parents. When I, was in, when I was a primary school teacher, if I wanted to speak to a parent because I had a little concern about Johnny and something wasn't quite yeah. happening, they just couldn't get enough of me. They were there. They wanted to know. Now I'm in early years. If I say I've got a bit of a concern about Johnny, it's it's a look of, well, who the hell are you? Yeah. Um, and and I, that was a really telling moment for me. And I tell you, share it from Claire's point of view. I'm, a, I'm an adult education teacher by background who got very little knowledge in their teacher training course about ch how adults learn and develop. So there's even less uh, as the focus in children. And it is a different, and I do think that notion, one of the things we talk about assessment is, and as, as Natalie said, it's knowing the child, but it's also knowing the parent and nurturing that relationship with the parent. And yeah. there is no reason why parents have a good understanding of their importance yeah. Yeah. of and the engagement of how their children learn in the early years. There, there is no handbook, as we always say, mm -hmm. when you become a parent. And, mm -hmm. and so that, that it is our role and responsibility to nurture that because we only get a good understanding where the child is if we can have those conversations with the parents um, and understand their circumstance as well yeah, yeah. i totally agree it's so totally important agree. isn't it so so uh, important can i bring us on to observations um so in the revised and this is for claire and um and to Na um, natalie um in the revised development matters the word notice is being used rather than observe um, which is great, but you know, assessment is about noticing what children can do and what they know. And the changes state that the written observations are no longer required as evidence. Um, how important, Claire and Natalie, do you feel that observations are? And do you think that the changes to the EYFS of this sort of recommendation might result in us losing an important part 
of understanding our children and their progress? Definitely something I think we're nervous about. We are worried about it. Um, we would like to, we do feel that in the last few years there's been far too much of the iPad in the classroom going on. Mm. I'd like to actually go back, back to much the, the past of the occasional post-it note, writing down things. We, If we have a child with needs, as Natalie was discussing with me earlier, we, we do need to do you do have to have quite a lot of observations on that child and you can't, I think it's wonderful that there's this push for kind of putting the trust in the practitioner and sort of knowing it all up here and I think that's so important to know your child inside out but particularly with a child with sort of additional needs there's only so much you can hold in your head at any one time for however many children you've got and we will still need evidence for things. Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. that's so true. That's not going to disappear, you know, for SENFs, for EHCPs. You know, there's still going to be evidence required, I'm yes, assuming. Of course, of course. Exactly. I think that sort of scattergun approach is, to observations that Jackie talks about, I love scattergun observations, um, that, that needs to go, doesn't it? You know, yeah. It needs to be meaningful observations. Practitioners must make sure that they're any well, observations are meaningful. Exactly. Not doing observations because you know you've got to do observations. Exactly. Yeah. Seeing yeah. something and really noting it. So hopefully this change will help that feeling I've got to do observations. But then again, coming back to the professionalism of the practitioner to know actually this is really important. I've seen a skill that I hadn't noticed before and I need to make sure this is noted down because mm. this is going to be really important. So um, I think it's it's really good for meaningful get meaningful observations, yeah. but it's it's coming back to the practitioner. What do you feel, Alex? Is this something? Yes, that... I wanted to come in again with yeah. when I had my LA hat. And yeah. practitioners would often come to an observation assessment and planning session, and they would say, "How many, Alex? Can you tell me how many? What is the magic <laughs> number? The magic number, don't they?" <laughs> And I, or the magic net recipe for sent children, that's the other one, <laughs> but that's another conversation. And I would always say, how long is a piece of string? Uh, you know, observation. Yeah. And again, I don't know where the messages go wrong, like Michael was saying earlier on about the uh, early learning goals, but observation was never about tick list. It was okay. never about doing a thousand. It was never about repetition. It's about celebrating those unique moments that a child <laughs> mastered the skill. So I always used to say, you need to tell me as a practitioner or a teacher, what is the significance of learning of your observation? What does it actually tell you about that child? And yeah. why is it significant to note it down? Because if it's not, you shouldn't be noting it down. Exactly. And if you're doing it correctly, equally so, it shouldn't be a burden. Yeah. I, I, I enjoyed when I was going, and, and Claire can share that, when, when I used to visit my settings as a local authority advisor, I loved to do observations on the children because I would see them do, do something and there would be a wow moment. And I would note something down, even though I was there for a different purpose, and I will hand it to the key person. And I would say, you might have that observation, but if you don't, for me, that was really amazing what that child did. Yeah, yeah. So it's okay. really important not to lose that, isn't it? It's really I'm very important. Well, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you just, 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 just look just, at that, don't you? Yeah. Well, I think Natalie um, hit the nail because there is that, there is that issue about there are certain times and for certain children it is essential that you you have more detail and it's of those children about whom you have concerns for something and 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 that does need to be recorded at so but i think also the, the 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 sort of towers that we created was in terms of the whole thing that somehow next steps led on from observations as well and so you've got seven areas of learning you're doing the observations three times a week and you're getting two next steps for each other suddenly for each child about whom you've got no issues whatsoever you somehow got 25 yes. next steps and, and that is it's just we're, we're creating a rod for our own back and and i was smiling when you mentioned noticing because i've been trying to make myself get over this um it's that that phrase really 
upset me. I can imagine why they they chose it because they want to make it realize that it's quite an informal thing and you're almost passive. It's happening and you spot it. Yeah. But actually observing is a learned skill. Yes, yes. And it's somehow it's it's deprofessionalizing what the people are doing. Back to Claire's point, it is not noticing it. You are observing it, reflecting yeah. on what you have seen and thinking, right, what happens now? Notice it. I, th I think they probably misspelled it. They meant noting. And unfortunately, it's a typo, but I do have to get over it. Really. <laughs> right. yeah. Claire, you were going to say something about that, were you? Or... No, I was just saying, I hope that was a typo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> very, so, very important. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's and I one of the questions that's come up now on the I think it's a line, comment. It's a comment. Well, it's how can we provide details of when a child um, of where a child is in relation to accessing support in the form of an EHCP without meaningful observations? And I right. get really involved with parents when they're initiating an EHC needs assessment. And one of the key things that the local authority needs is. Um, evidence. Mm. So there are times when those observations are going to be really important for evidence for the support that a child would need and that you can show you've put the right support in place and they still haven't made enough progress to um, that they to show that they actually need more support. So I think, as Michael said, uh, the situation is different for for different children, mm. isn't it? Mm. Um, so just, just sort of moving on, um, as a speech and language therapist, one of the things that I noticed is there's a focus on language and literacy um, in the new um, revisions and, and just and saying that, you know, language underpins all areas of learning and which I obviously agree with and um, that uh, having a communication rich environment is really important. Um, and I just wanted to ask, because we mentioned this once before, and um, when I was talking to you, Claire and Natalie, um, about what has been the impact of lockdown on children's language and social communication. And um, now, are you seeing quick changes? Are, can you see that if there was an impact that the progress, now they're back in and things are sort of coming back to normality um, that that you're seeing changes again in children's language and social communication did you notice anything first of all uh, it was uh we did um i think mostly the language definitely personal and social communication so they'd obviously been without a lot of them hadn't seen other children mm -hmm. Hadn't had uh, uh, opportunities to share or, or or learn any of those skills. Um, I have to say, and uh, Jackie, you probably know this, that I have got more children doing speech and language therapy within within the setting than I've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, Speaking to other nurseries, that's very much across very much nurseries, across, it's across, not, across you know. nurseries, not just us. Wow. Um, I think. Children are getting back to where they were. We had a lot of children who, who should have started earlier and then started after lockdown, who had huge separation anxieties. We had a lot of problems with separation anxiety. Um, I, and we have, what we did was we have taken, we were taking children at two and a half. We are actually taking them just above two now because we realize a lot of them have missed that social mm -hmm. communication with other children and have been with our adults. So we have started taking them a little bit earlier than we usually would, which I, I think is helping it get back to balance. I am slightly nervous on September because I have to realize that a lot of these children will have been in the situation of having come to us at about, they're coming to us about two, three, two, four, but they will have been in a lot of lockdown for, the, for, for a lot of their lives. Mm -hmm. So we think we, we are expecting that they might not be on where they should be in uh, in language and social communications and things mm -hmm. when they get to us, but we can't really tell till that <laughs> happens. No, we have noticed, definitely we? noticed. And I think that goes back to the importance of observation assessment. You know, so we can track these children and be aware of where the input needs to come from. Yeah, no, yeah. that's so true. And yeah. interesting that you're talking about attachment too. 
that that because we had a look we did a sort of some data analysis and and noted that attachment as well as um social communication and self-awareness were all impacted weren't they yes quite a lot and in the other areas is the physical skills as well physical skills. so it's the yeah. three prime areas that i think have had the biggest impact and unless we can get that right for these children the other areas yeah. aren't going to go on yes. yes it is so assessment is going to be really important isn't it in september yeah uh, I mean, our two year our two-year-old um assessment is going to be absolutely vital i think Absolutely, I can see that. I really can see that. So, what's happening with the two-year-old, the two-year check now? Is that uh, something? We're doing it in conjunction with the health visitor, but we just discussed that with my health visitor. She rang me early in the week because I wanted a discussion with her. Um, and they are. Uh, we will do it in school. In fact, unless they've had it done, if they have had it done by the health visitor, fine. And we'll have a copy of their pink, um, the pink book of uh, the page. Uh, otherwise, we will do, and uh, we always have done a thorough assessment after about six weeks. Yeah. With, mm. um, and we will continue to do that, and we will send the results to the health visitor. And then the health, but we will contact the visit, health visitor and chat to her or get her to come in if we have concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. And that's part of what we put on our pathway as well. Isn't yes. It? Yes. We have, we have got a two year check there. It's so important, isn't it? Particularly yeah. now, as you say, that's going to be such a huge part of their lives that they've lived in mm. a lockdown. Oh, my goodness. It really is. So we've got, got questions. Some, we've here. got some questions. Um, we've got one about Ofsted. <laughs> what will Ofsted be looking for in terms of assessment? Okay. okay, so hard. It's hard to say what they're looking for because it is very much up to you. Um, mm -hmm. So you yep. have the flexibility and the freedom um, to design your own curriculum and decide on what assessment method matches the curriculum that you're delivering. So you can choose your own assessment methods. Now, oh. again, I've got concerns in absence of using uh, uh, you know, a, a framework that we all use in the sector, we can all get a little bit lost in translation. So um, if you're not looking at anything else, I would definitely advise you to look at birth to five in terms yes. of the different stages that they've got and explore other um, assessment um, systems and, and tools that they are out there like, like our pathway. Yeah, yeah, great. And I think th that that practitioners will be confident to talk about uh, yes. their children and show that they know their children um, will be really important, won't it? I think yeah. that's really important, Jackie, to really be confident in what you're delivering and what your curriculum looks like and why it looks like the way it does. Um, and and uh, sorry, can I, I just I, I didn't mean to talk across you, Alex. I'm Sorry, I, I just on that and just a couple of comments that were coming in terms of the reference to 60% of children returning with a speech and language delay. Yes. Setting and just thinking about your Ofsted inspection, your curriculum now is not the same as your curriculum before the pandemic yes. because yeah. you need it to respond to the needs of the children you currently have. Even the children you had before are not the same children as when they left you for all the reasons that Claire had said. And I would agree absolutely with Natalie that I think I mean, it's not for me to determine your curriculum in any of your providers, but that issue that we've always known, if you get the three prime areas right for the child, by the time the children leave to go to school, that child will be fine. If they're physically developing in a way that is, is OK, if they're confident in their communication skills with their peers and their important other adults and socially and emotionally, they're able to manage themselves, manage their social relations, that child will be fine. Let the teachers in school compulsory school worry about that and that is a that i think that's even stronger now with this generation of children who have had an unprecedented early years experience we have to make sure that our curricula reflect their circumstances and so any practitioner should be thinking well we're not doing the same as we did previously because our children are different and they have different needs mm -hmm. that's good, that's good. Yeah, yeah. very true very true um, we've got a question from Francesca Chambers. Um, if that, but going back to observations, and we can't talk enough about observations, really. If there is no need for written observations, where do you suggest recording those meaningful post-it styled observations? 
I think, can I answer that quickly? Yes. We, we, we will continue to do observations on, we, as I said, we use art pathways. We will continue to not have the iPads in the classroom. We will be writing down post-it notes. It takes two minutes maximum for that teacher then to put it into the system. It yeah. couldn't be, it couldn't be easier. ARC does so much of the hard work for you and then gives the teachers the resources on how to move that child on. Um, so we will be recording them. Yeah. It's not, you know, we, it, it's not time consuming. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it's not saying don't record anything, is it? No. It's just, no. saying, no. It's, yeah. Yeah, they won't be used not as evidence. Not a huge amount. Yeah. You don't have to use yeah. them as yeah. evidence. And making sure that what the teachers are putting down are really, really meaningful. Yes. Yeah. Exactly, Natalie. Exactly. We've got another question here. This one's on progress tracking. It says, if Development Matters was never supposed to be a progress tracker, why has it got observation checkpoints on it now? Surely it will become another way of tracking progress. Who'd like to tackle, like that, to one? tackle that one? <laughs> Absolutely, I totally agree with it. And, and as I was saying earlier on, if the tracking got us to where we are at the moment, and you know, we, we have done so much progress, you know, I know that the DfE is concentrating on the 30% of the children that are not achieving a good level of development at the end of reception, but 70% are, and we've come a long way from where we used to be, you know, from the 50%. And um, so why were we not celebrating this progress and, and why we're not looking at what was actually helpful with, with tracking yes. and help us improve the outcomes for our children and what wasn't so helpful that maybe we can change moving forward rather than going 360 and saying observations are not helpful, we're moving away from assessment, let's just have a scrapbook instead of a learning record. Yes. Again, going back to what Claire was saying, I think that doesn't send the right messages for the sector you know and we feel like rather in a few years time or a couple of years time we're going to swing back again it's going absolutely. to be a, unless we can find a good middle ground it's it's going to swing again no we've had so many changes haven't we yeah. and they want us to go back to 40 years ago when we were it was all in our brain and we didn't and we knew the child fine but the reason they put in this was because that was not working yeah, yeah. Exactly. maybe it's gone too far the other way but as you say we've got to find the middle ground on this yeah. exactly it's not, it's not just about the individual child either is it i mean we use we use um our assessment tools we look at where we are as a nursery we look at the gaps is it something we're not doing yeah, right exactly. do we need more resources in this do we need more training in this why have we got a percentage of children struggling in this area how can we rectify that so it's not just the individual child it's the overall setting we're looking at no. That's oh. so true, Natalie. That yeah. is so true. That's so good. Um, can we move on? Keely Parker has a question. Can you explain what tracking and assessment should look like? Gosh, that's a good question. We've kind of answered it a bit, but what should it look like? That's a good one. Who'd like to answer that one? I can, I can give it a go. I think, again, it goes back to you, your curriculum, and what you want uh, for your children and how you want to track them. So, yeah. for example, if you are a nursery class, uh, part of a school, and you've got nursery and reception, and it sort of works for you to have a middle, high and low assessment system, so an emerging, expected, exceeding, um, and that's a model that you use further up in your school, then potentially that could be a model that you can use in, in your nursery class. Um, if you have used the um, previous EYFS and you found it useful, um, and it, you think it's important to have ages and stages, then the birth to five, which is the closest that we had to the previous framework that we had, might be um, a way that you want to track the children and identify where exactly they are in terms of different stages. Not use it as a checklist, but identify where your children sit on those stages. Mm. That's so good. That's uh, so uh, good. The, 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 uh, it's, it's interesting that you can imagine in the steering group for the development of the birth to five matters, this whole issue of people want to be able to identify the best fit where not necessarily if that's where the child should be, but what is the best articulation of the child who's in front of me at the moment, which, which the EYFS development matters grids in the 2012 version tried to do somehow we as a sector 
abused it and i mean that in the in the in an academic sense in terms of they, they were applied to a circumstance that was not their intention and so there was a real backwards and forwards in the discussions around the development of the birth of five matters publications and i think the compromise of the idea of ranges there are a series of ranges that mm -hmm. children may be at but there was still a nervousness because people somebody would say well yeah but i need to know the range in relation to the age of the child so that so i'm i'm not entirely comfortable with the fact that yes there are the ranges but on is it the next page or is it on the same page there's some there's a read across mm -hmm. to what you might expect that range to be for children in a certain and and we, we we may be part of the problem going forward again alex that somehow that gets contorted in some way to an expectation of what each child should be doing at a particular time in their life and that that isn't the intention of the publication and really that's the problem with anything as soon as you produce it it's it's open to be applied um by anybody who bothers to 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 reference it um so there is that nervousness that actually that's that treadmill which i think fundamentally building on claire's point is based on the fact that we're not necessarily all confident to to stand the ground with the head teacher or the ofsted inspector say I know that child over there came to us at 28 months at that time could do X. We have applied this bit of curriculum. Now she's 36 months old and this is where she's got to ask me anything you want to about that child. And that's what gets you your outstanding in an Ofsted report. And, and hopefully informs your head teacher that actually the child that will then be going into year one and beyond will be absolutely fine as long as the rest of the school performs as well. Mm -hmm. That's so good. I think there are two points for that for me are really important. We need to reflect as a sector on, on where we get things wrong and why then there is so much bad publicity about, I remember many years ago, it was, is it 80% child initiated, 20% adult led? <laughs> yeah, where did that come from? Yes. <laughs> Again, how many next steps, how many observations and all of that, and really have confidence in what you're doing in your setting and in your school in terms of your early years practice. I think that is hugely important. Yes. The, other, the other thing is, if the model, if the new proposed model works for you of having, of just assessing children as concern or non-concern, again, you can go ahead and, and use that model. What I can tell you is that, for example, the children that are in, in our nurseries, in our school, that model wouldn't work. Um, we as a parent, I'd be horrified to be told my child, child is of no concern. concern. <laughs> yes, so really. what are they Natalie <laughs> yeah. what are they? Oh. I mean it's it, yeah it's yeah. I agree yeah. Alexandra it's yeah so agree with you no, yeah. we, we, it, everyone's different every setting's different isn't it and you have to go you have to make that judgment for your own setting we've got a really interesting question here and it may be the last one we might be able to squeeze another one in uh Danny Bowen 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 I love that we will have the freedom to design our own curriculum, but really what does that mean? Exclamation mark, question mark. What kind of things can we do to make it specific to our setting? That's such a good question, Danny. I, I can give an example. <laughs> give us an example. In one of our schools, um, they've noticed that the children in year two are scoring um, a little bit lower than expected in terms of geometry, fractions and, and shapes, because obviously they're exploring um, the properties of, of, of 3D shape. So actually for them, it is really important to teach shape, space and measures in nursery. So as a result, they're not removing it from their curriculum. To the contrary, they're putting a lot of emphasis and they're tracking the progress of the children in nursery and reception in terms of how they're performing in relation to shape, space and measure. They will continue to assess the early learning goals um, for shape, space and measure because they want to see the difference that that will have um, in year two. Uh, similarly, if you're finding that your children are not doing well in terms of independent skills, you might want to keep the emphasis on independent skills. Or as Claire was saying, if there is the language element, then you need to focus on language. Yeah. But you need to be able to assess your children and your starting point, their starting points, to then shape your curriculum accordingly. Mm, that's, that's so great. good. It's very seasonal, isn't it? The curriculum, mm. it has to be seasonal. So it changes, I, yeah. 
and and I think there is just building on Alex's point there. What you've articulated is there is a curriculum which is the articulation of the values and aspirations of the setting as a whole. But there will be individual curricula at at room level, yeah. um, in terms of cohort levels, and that can flex. So so this notion of curriculum is a very high level principle. And and I, just my way of example for for Daniel was it I think or um, the question um, is I would take it back to those success in the three prime areas people every child to leave this nursery absolutely confident in terms of their communication their social skills etc the mechanism for delivering that is the characteristics of effective learning that's playing and exploring crit creative and critical thinking uh, having active etc and the themes through which we do it are the, the, the four specific areas and whether that's your fundamentally outdoors or if there's a, a mathematics element that Alex has said. So it's, it's knowing how the EYFS and its various components work for you from its principles and values down through how you implement and what you expect as the outcomes. And, mm -hmm. and, and it, it provides us that opportunity, as Clara said, to, to be confident to mold that to our own circumstances, to your own circumstances. So Absolutely good. great. So good. Well, Have we got time for that last very one? Very quick one. Yes. What? One from Viv Thompson. Just during recent approval visit, an inspector told me that in their inspector training, there was a heavy emphasis on child-led learning. Um, and she's quoted the 80-20. Um, and, that one of the, <laughs> and that one of our main focuses as leaders should be on the teachers knowing when to step in and when to step back. Do you agree with the new framework on this? <laughs> um, Jan de Biel, who you may all know, used to work for QCA, is now out in Hong Kong. He owns up to saying in a conference about 10, 15 years ago, an, an off the cuff reference to 8020. And somehow this, he blames himself somehow for creating this myth that it, it, it sort of changes and there is this balance. Um, it's not even the previous articulation of it, correct me if I'm wrong, said it evolves over time as the children age and as they progress through the early years foundation stage. It, it's just say, so yeah, just let it go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I'm sure I, I'm not disagreeing with um, what you heard from an Ofsted inspector, but I think Alex would say certainly the trainers of those Ofsted inspectors would probably have chosen not to use that phrase. That's probably my assumption. Yeah, great. Right. That's good. Thank That's you good. so much. We've just come to the end now. Haven't we, we have, we have. Gosh, it goes so fast, doesn't it? And I, we're aware there are questions that we haven't answered and um, because we haven't had time, but we will note each question and, and do our best to answer those through either future webinars or on our social media. And of course, you can always contact us, us at info at artpathway.com. Um, we have recorded it. I'm afraid we pressed the button after we've made all our introductions. <laughs> so you'll miss the first bit. Very sorry about that. Um, and that will be available in the next few days as soon as we sort of get it re ready to put on our social media and also on our blog page on our website, which is artpathway.com. Um, and we also we've got another webinar on the 15th of June at 11 a.m., which is going to be amazing. Um, it's talking to the Australian author, Daisy Turnbull, who um, is a teacher and director of wellness and well-being. And she wrote a book, which we both we love right. it, um, 50 Risks to yeah. Take with Your Child. Yeah. child oh, uh, brilliant. With your kids, 50 Risks to Take with Your Kids. So good, like physical risks. Social oh, risks. I wish I'd read. Risks. I wish I'd read it because oh, so I, I was the parent who was driving behind the child on the bus because I was worried that you know <laughs> the son on a bus without me. And so it, this is a real revelatory look on how we can help the bubble wrap generation, and it's it's just so good. So do join us on the eleventh of uh, tenth. Oh, which day is it? Fifteenth of June 15. at eleven a.m. <laughs> But thank you so much to the panel. They've been yes. amazing, haven't they? Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Natalie. Very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. And yeah. um, we look forward to seeing everyone at the next webinar. And in the meantime, yeah, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you so much. Have a lovely holiday. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.